where we talk about love, death, sex, religion, and all the big questions worth asking. I'm your host, Robert K. Elder, and we are recording live from the bookstall at Chestnut Court in Winnetka, Illinois. Tonight, we're talking with Mike Thomas, a Sun-Times Media colleague and author of You Might Remember Me, The Life and Times of Phil Hartman. The Big Questions is sponsored by Sure, purveyors of professional microphones and headphones. You can check them out at Sure.com. That's S-H-U-R-E dot com. The Big Questions podcast is also part of the Sun-Times Media Local Podcast Network. Mike, welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, so the big question I want to get to, and I want to circle back around to, um, is sort of the biographer's quandary, which is how close can you get to the truth of a person? So that's kind of going to be my through line. Gotcha. But let's start off a different way because I want everything else to inform that. And that is, this is your, your second book with a, with comedy at its core. The first was Second City Unscripted, sort of a, a history of that, that venerable institution. So how did that book lead to this one? Well, I just think I've been steeped in comedy for a long time. I, I don't think anything about the subject matter led to this book, but, uh, uh, you know, I had watched SNL for years, and I know a lot of those people from Second City obviously went on to SNL and, and another venture. So I was, I'm j I was always just very aware of, um, of Phil Hartman um, as an actor and, uh, you know, as a comedic icon. Um, somebody just emailed me out of the blue one day who had interviewed me for the Second City book, mm -hmm. and he knew I was looking for another subject. His name's Vince Vaselli. He's a former comic here, author. And he just said, I'd love to read a book about Phil Hartman. And I went, that's brilliant. Because as I said, I, I mean, I knew Phil from his work. I knew from the writings that were done after he died. I knew virtually nothing about his life. So it, it started there. Well, and, and one of the things I got from the book was this, this great sort of insider's track on his life. There's a ton of stuff I did not know, including that, uh, you know, he was an album artist. He did... The Crosby, Stills and Nash uh, logo, all of the America records, basically Poco, um, and mm -hmm. sort of being a graphic artist was his, his way in. But also, you know, his public persona, you know, sort of the professional blowhard. He played all those authority figures. It was kind of the opposite of who he was. He was a sort of like poetry loving, dope smoking, at least in his early life. Sort of a hippie guy. Is that yeah, fair? well, Phil loved dope throughout his entire life. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was, uh, Phil was a, a hippie. He was a rock roadie back in the 60s. He loved pot. He loved to surf. Mm -hmm. And you're right. A lot of the characters he played probably gave people the idea that Phil was that guy with kind of a stick in his butt, you know, mm -hmm. the, or the, the boss or the president or Peter Graves or, but Phil was the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and talk to me in general. Again, you've talked to a lot of comedians, not only for the Second City book, but for this book. And comics in particular, I think moreover than any other sort of performer, their public and private personas can be very different and sometimes polar opposites. How, how do you explain that? How do I explain why they're so um, sort of ebullient? In well, public and, and maybe withdrawn in private, you mean? Or? Yeah, not only that, but I think more than any other kind of performer. Like, you know, um, I, I was thinking about this for Stephen Colbert. Like, you know, I, I saw some backstage footage of him and Jon Stewart and Conan O'Brien sort of, you know, talking through a bit. He was the most, he was the quietest, most reserved guy. Sure, a lot of them tend to be very introspective. I mean, when, when they're thinking of material, I don't know if I have a solid answer for that. But I, I just think in a lot of cases, too, it's the crowd whether it's TV crowd or live crowd that brings them alive. And, and there's something in them that doesn't quite come out unless there's that feedback that they can feed off of. So I think that's part of it. But what are the real world consequences of that? What, you know, that, well, the real world consequences is, is I guess it can ruin relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're like Phil, for instance, could be emotionally withdrawn. Right. Um, you know, he was just a, a, a great on stage and he had all this energy, but when he was off, especially in dealing with his relationships, he was not emotionally available, uh, to the women in his life. I mean, they would start out intensely, passionately, the relationships and inevitably they, they peter out. Um, and that happened with all three of his wives. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think that's one of the things, you know, uh, unfortunately that, that, uh, people, remember is this unfortunate end and you begin the book with that um can, can you tell that story just a little bit well i i start the book with a day before um he died he and his friend uh brit who used to go out with phil on his boat and used to fly with him on his plane they used to go to catalina island a lot off the coast of la and that was phil's getaway 
but they're driving down to get uh, parts for their boats um, in Newport. Um, and Phil lived in Encino. It was a fairly short drive, but they were talking on the way of of death and what each wanted uh, in, in the case that that he died. And um, you know, Britt wanted his uh, remains to be put in this gel cap and placed at the top of I think it was Diablo Peak. And uh, very specific. Yes, yeah, so it's very specific. <laughs> they both had very specific requests. And when the rains came, it would wash the the remains down into the canyons below. And uh, Phil, uh, for a second time, reiterated that he wanted his ashes scattered in 15 to 20 feet of water around this natural monument called Indian Rock in uh, Emerald Bay, just off the coast of Catalina. And um, uh, he also told Britt, uh, you know, what makes you think you're going to die first? And that was less than 24 hours before he was killed. Mm-hmm. And and what was the answer? What, what made him think he was... Well, I, I think Phil had this feeling i you know he never expressed it according to friends i talked to but i think he had this feeling that maybe his time on earth was short because he packed a lot into it i mean i i have no instance of him saying i'm gonna die young i'm gonna burn out there's there's none of that but i i think maybe it was just this this feeling that he had well and there are a lot of comics and i think the the new yorker review uh maybe touched on this um but there are a lot of comics, Belushi and, you know, even, you know, Pryor, all of these guys led these dangerous lives. Hartman did not seem to be one of them. He wasn't one of them at all. Yeah. I mean, that made it all the more shocking yeah. uh, because it didn't come. I mean, uh, Farley's death, tragic, Belushi, Belushi's death, tragic. But you, you could see in a way, I mean, they were so self-destructive. You know, you, you could sort of envision, well, maybe there's going to be a horrible end here if they don't stop doing this. But the Phil's came from the outside and nobody truly had a grasp on his third marriage and how how much discord there actually was. And so when he was killed, people were stunned and they're stunned to this day. Yeah. And uh, for people who, who don't know, um, she, uh, her, her name was Bryn? It was Bryn, Bryn. yeah. Uh, she shot him probably in his sleep, uh, and then an hour later killed herself. Is that right? Uh, it was many hours later, many hours actually. Later. Yeah. She shot him in his sleep, uh, you know, early morning hours of May 28th, and then called a friend of hers and kept saying, I killed Phil, I killed Phil, and he didn't believe her. She drove over to this guy's house. His name's Ron Douglas. Uh, she had known him for like 15 years. And uh, he basically sobered her up and followed her back to her house in Encino, where he finally saw Phil and went, oh, my God. And that's when he made the 911 call. Yeah. Well, and I don't want to dwell too much on on the death. I, I'm I'm interested in a, in a legacy, and again, this the central question of of how do you know what you know? How close can you get to a person? But you interviewed a lot of comics for the book, um, and Julia Sweeney, who I, who I think is a native here, or mm-hmm. not a native. She, I think, no, she no, lives. I was, I was gonna, is yeah. she in the audience? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, and we'll met. We'll met. Okay. Um, uh, she has this very um, empathetic. Uh, reaction to this tragedy uh and she said she thought it was brave of Bryn to to kill herself please explain that to me <laughs> i can't explain it that that was her feeling she didn't mince words she was you know she declared that that's the way she felt about Bryn's actions and that's that's hopped off the page for a lot of people who've interviewed me yeah for this because it just it, it it's the opposite of what everybody else thinks there are there a lot of people think it was a cowardly way out and yeah. But she did. She felt she. I think she used the word empathy. I, I, I for Bryn the night Phil died. Although she does say that you know it was a horrible action, completely her fault. Yeah. But part of her felt that, and she said it. And I was really appreciative of that. I love it when people express their true feelings. And and she was one of the best interviews I had in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, you interviewed a, a ton of folks for this. Uh, Lauren Michaels, uh, sort of a, a lot of that cast, a lot of friends. Um, uh, what were you surprised by um, as you talked to them? What were the, sort of the, the the breadcrumbs that you followed after those interviews? You know, I think I was probably most surprised at how how deep Phil was. I mean, he 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 played a lot of um, you know arrogant, smarmy characters, guys who didn't have much depth to them. But he loved philosophy. He loved religion. He loved just sort of chilling out and thinking about the universe. And he had done this since he was a teenager. Um, and, uh, that, that was one thing that surprised me, um, is the, the sort of, uh, depth of his emotional life, although he wasn't an emotional guy. I mean, he wasn't, he didn't have that connection with a lot of the people around him. Well, and, and, um, 
who did you want that was unlikely to talk or did not want to talk? I would have liked to have talked to Dana Carvey, but um, I, you know, and, and I, I never got a response as to why he didn't talk for this. I have a feeling it's because he's very close to Phil's now adult children um, who decided not to participate, which was fine because they were only six and nine uh, when Phil died. And I didn't press the issue. I, I did approach them, but I, I think that's probably the reason he didn't participate. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I got just about everybody uh, you know, I, I wanted, there were, there were just a few holdouts. So, so again, you didn't know him, you didn't meet him. Um, but I want to come back to the central question about getting to the truth of a person in a, as a biographer. Um, tell me about that. I mean, how, how do you feel? How close did you get? And you know, what were the challenges in, in, in bringing him back to life on, on the page? Uh, well, I, I didn't really know how close I got until I started getting feedback from his brothers and his ex-wives and his friends, people who really knew him throughout his entire life and in different stages of his life who told me, you brought him back on the page. I mean, a biographer is never sure. You can put all the facts together and express them as eloquently as you as you can, but you never truly know. And, and I was really heartened by the fact that, that these people thought it was... And there's a lot of dark stuff in here, too. Yeah. So it's, you know, and it's not all flattering, but uh, these, uh, these emails and calls I got w- w- told me I was on the mark, and I was really glad to hear that. Mm-hmm. Well, and it you know, again, there's this tragic end that I think illuminates some of the book. Uh, and uh, speaking selfishly is whenever I come across that kind of reporting, uh, I always project onto it. So I, uh, I'm going to ask you, you know, as you were reading this about he and his best friend, you know, coming back and talking about their own demise and what they'd like done, uh, did it make you think about what you would like done? And if somebody's writing a book about you, how how you would choose, how you would hope they would handle it? Uh, I haven't thought much about it. I mean, I think oh, now, now's your chance. Yeah, okay. now's my we, chance. We, we we can stop. You can think about it, and I'll edit it. I, yeah. I like the ashes thing. I, I've never thought about where I want to be sprinkled, though. You know, that's something I have to contemplate. If uh, you know, I don't know if I want to be sitting on somebody's mantle forever. Yeah. Um. So I have to think of a place. Thank you. You you got the wheels like, like turning. Beyond, Beyonce's mantle. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I could. Well, I'd sit on Beyonce's mantle. Okay. I mean, that would okay. be fine. There's not a lot of sitting involved, but I'm just, <laughs> just, just saying. Um. Uh. But the thing, again, that would have been so easy with Belushi or Farley, is a, a lesson. You know, are, are there any lessons, or is this a tragedy without lessons? Or what would what do you think? You know, it's it's. Now, listening to his brother John talk, I, I came across this this tape of uh, a, a memorial service they did at the Paramount Theater on the Paramount lot right after Phil died, actually a couple of months after he died. And his brother John, who never shies away from the darker aspects of, of this tragedy, uh, told people when he was speaking, what does it all mean? It means nothing. This was just something that happened one day in the West. And I went, wow, that's just stark. I mean, he, so he, that was his thought on that. Now, I don't know that it does mean anything. If it's symbolic of anything, is that what you're Not even if it's symbolic, if they're just any lessons. Um, Again, he was married three times. This was his longest marriage. He did have trouble with relationships. But again, I just had a hard time in reading the book. And I was wondering if you had any insight or somebody told you something that's like, okay, this is what we can learn from this other than this is awful. Stay emotionally connected. Yeah. I, that's the takeaway I, I, I got, but you know, I mean, other people might have other interpretations, so I'm sorry. I can't answer. No, 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 no. Solidly. No. Well, it also made me uh, think about his legacy. Uh, you know, he got famous later in life. Uh, I think he was 38. Is that right? He was 38 when he was on SNL. Yeah. yeah. And so he was older than some of his peers. Um, and one of the things your book did was, uh, illuminate, um, his history. I had no idea that he helped develop the Pee Wee Herman character and he was actually a, a co-writer, um, for, uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And that's how he got into the show when Pee Wee or when Paul Rubens, uh, hosted the show as Pee Wee, he was sort of brought along as a writer. So that was his entree. Um, he sort of is all over pop culture. Yeah. Like he was sort of, it, it's amazing that he wasn't sort of, more well known for all of the things he did and not just the Simpsons and not just news radio, but he was everywhere. What, what do you think, I don't know, enabled him to be that 
sort of a comedic zealot. I mean, he really was in a lot of pots. Yeah, he was in. A, he did a lot of cartoon. Phil loved to work. He loved to make money. So yeah. he was all over the place. He took whatever came his way, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I never thought of him as a as a zealot. I guess he did do a lot of a, a different. Um, um, sort of shows and cartoons, and I mean, he started with Pee Wee at the Groundlings, so yeah. that's how they knew each other on Melrose Avenue, and and that all sort of snowballed. It grew into a big stage play, and then it grew into the movie, and then it grew into the TV show. And you know, part of Phil's thing, part of the reason I think he wasn't um, a bigger star when he died is because he was typically content to play smaller roles. I mean, that got on his nerves toward the end of SNL that he wasn't a bigger breakout character and he was hoping to be a leading man in the movies. But he was always, as they called him at SNL, the glue. And that worked to his advantage because he was in so many things. Um, and it also worked to his disadvantage because he was never really that standout guy. He wasn't the Will Ferrell. He wasn't the Adam Sandler. Well, yeah, and he, he even said it himself that, you know, he didn't want to be, you know, the next Belushi. He wanted to be Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, you know, and, the and, utility guy. Yeah. So so uh, I'll just circle back to that that uh, question, and, and that is, so what is his legacy? Again, because he's, he's all over The Simpsons. He's all over TV. You know, his Sinatra is definitive in some ways. What's his legacy? His legacy, I, I mean, you know, Phil was utterly committed to whatever – he did. Um, uh, Jan Hooks told me even the smallest parts, he played them for blood. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a, he had, he had so much talent. Um, and I think that combined with the hard work and the confidence he had, uh, from knowing that he could always go back to designing album covers or, you know, being an artist that, that informed his work too, because he could put himself out there on stage thinking to himself, well, you know, it, my world's not going to cave in if I, if I uh, crash and burn here. So, you know, that's a bad way to sum up his, his legacy, but I, um, I've honestly not thought too much about that, about a, like one specific, uh, you know, uh, sentence to, to sum it up. Well, I mean, he's definitely sort of, you know, in the co comedic evolutionary chain, you know, he is the predecessor to Stephen Colbert. And, you know, those, uh, so those sort of like, uh, yeah, the pompous, blowhard, straight faced. They're sort of, like, he was his own straight man in some, in some ways. It was really strange. Yeah. No, he was. He was the, um, uh, the intelligent moron, I yeah. guess. You know, I mean, a lot of his characters had that. Troy McClure was not very intelligent, I guess, but uh, over the Bill old, McNeil was yeah. intelligent yeah. On, on news radio, but he was also a lunatic. Yeah. And I Phil loved to play those roles. He loved to play assholes because he wasn't an asshole. He loved to play greasy guys because that was sort of antithetical to to who he was. And so, yeah, I guess he did start that sort of character that Colbert has 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 run with. Um, I, it's funny you say Colbert. I think they had the the same quality too. Of when you watch Phil play these schmucks, um, as when you watch Colbert play these schmucks, somehow there's this decency that's almost palpable. You can sort of see below the surface and it makes them more sympathetic and more palatable characters. I mean, even Colbert now, he'll let a little bit of himself yeah. shine through. And you could see that to some effect with, with, uh, to some extent with Phil as well. Mm -hmm. Um, coming back to, I, I guess this, this core, uh, I, again, uh, and we've even had a, a lot of comedians, uh, on, uh, on the show. Um, but there's always this weird mixture of, you know, mania and this sort of like hidden sadness, almost to the fact that it's a cliche. Yeah. Why? The Why? sad clown, you mean? Yes. Yes. To put too much of a Jerry Lewis point on it. Yeah. But, but explain that. Or, or do you have any insight? Again, you've talked to scores of comedians. I think great comedy comes from from truth and pain. So you're saying torture your children and they'll no, be funny. No, 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 you know, yeah, no, I always, I always kid my dad. I, I say, you know, you, you didn't smack me around enough. It's I, I, I could have been a lot funnier. We can start now am. if you that's, want. Yeah. Hey, okay. you do that? <laughs> um, no. So I think, I think that's, that's part of it. I mean, the, be the, the best comedy to, comedy to me is the truest comedy and truth is often dark, but, but is it, is it that simple? Is so much of it just the search for parental approval? Like, you know, 
Wow, you're getting deep here, man. I just I just finished that that Steve Martin book. That's that seems to be his, his you know life. Uh, was it uh, Living Standing Up? What, Born Standing Born Up. Born Standing yeah, Up. Yeah, I love that. His I love whole, it because he ended right before he got famous. Yeah, yeah. Well, he he or, or, or super famous, but yeah, he, super famous. He, he he um you know even through his you know million selling platinum albums, he just never got approval from his dad, and that seems to be the you know, the horse that drives a lot of these comedians. It does uh, sometimes. I don't, I mean, I, I, that seems too, too much of a blanket description. I, I mean, know. You can't I'm, to apply I'm, that to everybody. I'm, I'm asking but you Phil, to, you know, yeah. Phil never got the attention he wanted when he was growing up. He had seven other brothers and sisters. He had yeah. one sister. Four who was, of eight, right? Yeah. He was the yeah. middle child yeah. of eight. Um, and when he was in Canada, uh, he had a sister uh, who lived with him there for five years who was special needs. She had something called Angelman syndrome and she couldn't, she couldn't eat by herself. She, she, all her bodily functions had basically shut down and they didn't know what was wrong with her because mm-hmm. nobody could diagnose her. And so they lived with her and took care of her. Um, and Phil just slipped through the cracks a lot of days. His mother didn't pay attention to him. His dad was off as the traveling salesman. So there was, was always that. He even told David Letterman, you know, that's why I'm craving attention so much now, Dave, because, you know, I didn't get it when I was growing oh, there, up. There's a whole Eric Idle book about that, too. It's like, yeah. if you want to make somebody funny, um, take away uh, the mother's attention. That, <laughs> and, and there was a lot of that. Of course, Phil became her favorite in yeah. later life. So after you became famous, I mean, he could do no wrong. Yeah, in that, her that's eyes. what I'm hoping for. I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Keep hoping, right? Yes, <laughs> secretly. Um, I, I want to come back to this theme of, of just relationships. Um, he had a lot of uh, friendships, and those seem to be very um, uh, dear to him. And again, when you talk with people like Sweeney and and whatnot, uh, and he was her he was her professor, he was her teacher. You know, they they had this 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 bond. But why were romantic relationships so hard for him? You talked to both ex wives. Did you get any insight there? Well, yeah, and, and, and with friends too. Phil loved the sensation of the new. He loved new relationships. He, he loved, um, you know, the, the new, you know, emotions they brought. Um, and, and he was also, he had an artist's eye. He was infatuated with beauty. Mm-hmm. And he was, in a way, always looking for sort of the next best thing. Um, because he'd settle into these relationships and, and they'd get a bit stale and he would pull away. And then another one would come along. And so there was never that long-term attachment. So I think both of those things combined to sort of uh, be detrimental. Mm-hmm. And and did the wives um, sort of speak with sort of a similar experience? Uh, or did they have vastly different sort of ends to their, their relationships? Well, yeah. The, I mean, his, his first wife, um, not as much as the second. I mean, he was married very young. I mean, they were only in their very early 20s, 20, 21. And, you know, it just sort of, it, it petered out. They had various personal uh, issues, financial issues. She got pregnant, terminated two pregnancies that had to play a role, although Phil never, according to her, uh, was very emotional about that because he didn't wear his heart on his sleeve. And mm-hmm. um, so it, they just kind of uh, left each other after a couple of years. No fuss, no muss. The second one was more fraught with, with drama because it started very intensely, um, you know, uh, and then, you know, in the, in the middle of it, Phil started pulling away again. And, uh, you know, told her she never really loved him and, uh, was not supportive of her aspirations. And, and, um, it, you know, she couldn't really understand it, uh, at the time. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, they became friends later in life and talked through some of these issues. And she became, came his shoulder to cry on, really, when he had problems with his third wife, similar problems with his third wife. Mm. Because even with his second one, Lisa, he would avoid conflict. He hated conflict. I don't know if it was his upbringing or the Canadian in him or the whatever it was. Um, he, he was just, he wanted, um, he wanted people to really like him and he didn't want to um, discourage them or make them unhappy. And so he wouldn't engage and he would go into the bedroom and, and go to sleep or pretend to go to sleep. And he did that with Bryn too. And in the end, she shot him. Yeah. Um, before that got really, really dark, yeah, <laughs> I was, yeah. I was, I was going to ask you about the Canadian thing. Uh, you know, we have uh, in Chicago, you know, we have this tie to the, the second city stuff, uh, in Canada. And, you know, that seems to be the sort of pipeline that a lot of comics come in. So what is that Canadian thing? And I think you partly said it, it's this sort of like, uh, 
willingness or, or need to be liked. Um, and it's a, it's a need, but I'm going to say it's a need. <laughs> how, how about addiction? How about addiction? <laughs> I, I have approval. No, I have never met a Canadian that I that I, that I don't like. That isn't like cool. That isn't you know. It's just I I don't know I had, what it is. I had a border guard. They're, Let me tell very, you that later. <laughs> you had a border guard. Oh my god. I don't know. I just <laughs> I I I dig them. I don't know if it's a um a different outlook or. Um, you know, I can't really say specifically what it might have been. I mean, there, I don't is wanna... there something like in the maple syrup? Like, what is it that makes them such? Um, and again, this is a very broad brush, but um, you just look at all the folks that came from SETV. Um, and I've talked to lots of them too. Yeah, and I, I love them. I mean, Andrea Martin is great. I love Marty Short. I mean, they're just. Good people. I know. I know. I was going to say, <laughs> is there something about the cold that sort of like cures them or, you know? I have no idea. I guess. Uh, okay. That is the third yeah, book. The third book. That's the third book, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's, what's wrong yeah. or what's right with Canada? <laughs> uh, um, uh, does the way that uh, Phil died, how does it color his legacy? I mean, part of the reason I didn't dwell on, on the death uh, in, in this book is because it, it's overshadowed his life to such a great extent that it's the only thing some people think of when they think of Phil Hartman. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to really, I mean, there's, there's a lot about it toward the end, but most of the book is about his life. It's about everything that happened before leading up to this. And, um, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I hope people, um, it's funny. I've said this before, but at the end of Brian's song, and if you remember the Jack Warden voiceover, I, I'm crying. Where right he now. says, I'm "When people think right of now. of Brian Piccolo, you know, it's not how he died. They'll think of, but how he lived, how he did live." And I mean, that's corny the way I'm saying it. But I, I would like people to think of Phil Hartman's yeah. life and and not his not his death. Yeah, I'm not looking at him, but I know that Neil Steinberg is crying right now. <laughs> it's true. Um. So tell me about your favorite bit. Um, I, I always loved his, you know, drunken bully Sinatra. I love, you know, him as Charlton Heston reading Madonna's sex book. Uh, tell me about a favorite bit and why. I love the Sinatra one. I mean, of course, the Clinton at McDonald's. I mean, yeah. that's classic, you know, with the McNuggets and intercepted by warlords and him explaining policy. And I think that was his crowning achievement at SNL. Mm -hmm. But Frank, a close second. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, again, just why? Like, is it the way he played those characters or was it a cultural zeitgeist or you know what what was it that made that stick in your head and made that memorable for you? I, if, to me it was because phil didn't make them caricaturish i mean he really inhabited these these guys that he played and he didn't overdo them i mean people some people could overdo them to great effect like dana carvey his stuff was more caricaturish phil would study the mannerisms the hand motions the he knew where it was in his throat for clinton and for sinatra and he just sort of became them. It was, again, this utter commitment thing that he displayed at the Groundlings when he was playing characters on stage there. He went into the zone and he was these guys. And then he would snap out of it. And he actually talked about this. It was like he was in a dream state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that, that surfaced recently, uh, I think it's on YouTube, uh, and it's linked to some writing about your book, is his SNL um, audition tape. And that is amazing because they ask you to do impressions, but he chose to do impressions as a German impersonator <laughs> yeah, doing John Wayne, like so off the cuff. And, you know, during those tapes, nobody laughs, but in here you can hear people laugh. Yeah, no, you can. I mean, he got rare laughs. Uh, I, there's, there's a myth that Lauren Michaels never laughs. I mean, people have told me he, he breaks up if you're really funny, mm -hmm. but you can hear laughs in, in Phil's audition. A part of that audition, the way he came off so well, or the, the reason he came off so well, or part of it was because he had all but given up on the acting thing. And he just went into that with like, you know, if, if this is good, great. If not, I, I'll go back to drawing. I'll go back to being an artist. So he had this utter confidence on stage that just allowed him to perform these characters, uh, you know, with a plum. So, yeah. well, and he wasn't without support, you know, uh, one of the other sort of great stories is that, you know, Michaels came in to see him and, uh, you know, this company of people and he chose John Lovitz. 
and Lovitz yeah. was like, "You you chose the wrong guy." Well, that's that's another uh, thing that that was sort of skewed over the years. I mean, Lauren told me that Phil could have come in '85 if he wanted to because he chose Lovitz the year he was rebuilding his cast. Lauren had been gone for five years; the the place was in shambles, and so he was bringing in fresh blood. And he saw Lovitz at the Groundlings, and some other people thought too, "Why are you bringing John before Phil?" And John thought so, thought the same thing. Phil was going through a divorce at that time from his second wife. So he wanted to, to be there for that. Uh, a lot of turmoil. Um, and uh, he also didn't want to leave his kind of cushy California life. He was doing voiceovers. He was drawing. He didn't want to relocate and go east. It's hard to catch waves off No of waves Long in New York. It's really right. hard. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there, that was a big part of it. But, you know, the next year he got another opportunity to uh, to audition. And it, he even had his arm twisted for that. I mean, according to, to Lovitz, he's told this story that the, the flamboyant producer Joel Silver had to basically tell Phil, you're nuts if you don't do this. And Lovitz told him the same thing. So he went and auditioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, folks. So this is the end of my sort of official questions. But if you guys have questions, uh, please ask Mike uh, and then wait for me to repeat it so they can hear it on the mic. Um, and uh, we'll have a little uh, Q&A. What did I miss? Anyone? So, so the, the question is... Uh, uh, that uh, Phil Hartman was on Johnny Carson. He talked about this encounter with uh, Jimi Hendrix. Does the book go into that? It does, as a matter of fact. I mean, he was a roadie for his brother. His brother, John, was a music manager, and he managed early on this group called Rock and Foo uh, in Malibu. And they all lived in Malibu Colony together. And Phil lived in a little cabana on the beach, and uh, he would tour with them around the country. And uh, so at one point, they're playing a club all owned by Marshall Brevitz called The Experience, T-H-E-E, -E, uh, in, uh, in Hollywood. And, um, and, and Hendrix comes waltzing in one night. This is the story. And apparently it was, I want to say, uh, God, I can't remember who was playing drums at the time. But anyway, the spurs came loose. And, and so his drums were moving around the, the stage. Phil apparently rushed onto the stage and held down the drums while he's playing, and Hendrix is up there jamming, you know, and Phil's shaggy hair is going up and down. So that's his Hendrix story. Who else? Yes. So the question is, uh, he played so many great characters. Uh, did you get a sense of who were the characters that he loved? Um, you know, he, he, he loved to play Frankenstein. That was, this, I'm going to bring this over here like that. I think that'll do. That was one of his favorite characters to play. He uttered virtually no words. And, and it's one of the few characters that broke him up when he was on set because he told this story. Um, he's, he's sitting there and he's thinking he's on a talk show with Tarzan Tonto and he's Frankenstein and, uh, and Nora Dunn is playing the host. And Phil starts thinking to himself how stupid it must look for these three people, three characters, to be on a talk show. And so he starts laughing. And then he thinks to himself how stupid it must look for Frankenstein to be laughing while he's doing a talk show. And he just throws his hands up and eventually he busts through the back of the stage <laughs> wall. So he loved that. He loved Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer. This guy, he was a really slick counselor, but, you know, always trying to pull one over. I'm just a caveman. I don't, when I get a fax, I think, are there little demons in the machine that are, you know, um, uh, he wanted to make a movie. Yes. Yeah. Your modern world confuses me. Uh, but I do know, right. But of course he knew the damages that were due his, uh, his client. <laughs> Two million in compensatory. <laughs> uh, so I would, I would say those were the, his his big two i mean um in sinatra of course and clinton not only because he loved playing clinton but because it made him a lot of money because he was able to go do side things like harvey did with bush so he dug that too and and uh clinton uh liked it as well right it, there, I guess there are differing stories. I mean, right. Clinton claimed to have played Phil's bits during the '92 campaign. I mean, Phil hadn't really done that much Clinton yet. Mm -hmm. The real sharp barbs came after he was elected and phil always said clinton didn't care much for him mm. and that uh you know clinton actually sent him an autograph photo that said you know you do a, a pretty good impression mostly you know and, and phil took that to mean you know i've got my eye on you so yeah. don't step over the line <laughs> who else uh so the question is do you have to like 
the person? Do you have to like the work in order to write a great biography? I, I think you do, at least to some extent. I mean, I, I don't think you can live with a subject for years and not admire at least some of, of what that person's about or who they were or their work. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think, too, you can't go over the line uh, because you, you obviously have to maintain that journalistic distance so you can give a balanced account. But yeah, had I not admired Phil and his work, this would have been a slog. And there was no day that I went into my office and said, oh, God, I have to do this again. So I think that's necessary for your sanity as much as anything else. I've always found, especially in interviewing biographers, there are two kinds of biographers. And those who um, would want to meet their subject if it were possible, and the other who would never want to meet their subject. So, uh, which camp are you? Oh, I definitely would have loved to meet Phil. Yeah. I mean, he, he seemed like a, a great guy, you know, and just, uh, he tried real hard even after fame to be a regular guy. I mean, you know, he, he didn't move to a, he could have moved to, to a more secluded house. And it's fact, Victoria Jackson visited his house in the nineties and Phil's house. If you go there, it's like a thousand feet off a of busy Ventura Boulevard and it's very low slung and there's like one gate and. You know, and she was surprised. She said, oh, my gosh, homeless people could get in and, and, and rob him. And so, you know, Phil said, well, we're just regular people, you know. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you have been listening to the Big Questions podcast, part of the Sometimes Media Local Podcast Network. Our music is by Hernan Sanchez. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Thank you.